creatures that live in water and on land. Animals that are born like fish, but grow legs and walk. Ugly creatures that inspire legends of beauty. Amphibians have fascinated us throughout history. Ancient Egyptians believed frogs were divine and that men and women were made by the goddess Hecate, who had the head of a frog. Is it the human quality of frogs and toads which have led us to celebrate them in picture book and fairy tale? Or is it because they provide a clue to the story of evolution from water to land? The amphibian leads a double life. It starts out in water and becomes a creature living on the land. Amphi, bios, both sides of life. From swimming with fins to running with legs. The journey of evolution itself. The journey that has brought every one of us here. And that same transformation is happening now, many times over. For the process that has taken land animals millions of years these creatures accomplish in 12 weeks. It happens with almost every type of amphibian, with those that have tails, the salamanders, the newts, the sirens, with the rarely seen Sicilian, and with the largest group of all, frogs and toads. In all, there are three and a half thousand amphibian species, measuring anything from a baby's fingernail to the length of a man's arm. And living anywhere from 13,000 feet up in the snowy peaks of the Andes, to tropical rainforests, to deserts scorched by heat. Nine out of ten amphibians are either frogs or toads, but which is which? The toad skin is dry and knobbly, but despite the superstitions, it doesn't give you warts. This skin, moist and smooth, belongs to the frog. For thousands of years, the frog has been a symbol of fertility. The toad with poison glands behind each eye has long been associated with evil and witchcraft. In many ways, frogs and toads are alike. They constantly pulsate their throats to pump air to their lungs, and they both have strong back legs. But while toads walk, frogs jump, literally making a leap of faith as they close their eyes before takeoff. Some frogs can jump up to 36 times their own length, the equivalent of a boy jumping 50 yards in one leap. Their jumping skills have catapulted some frogs to stardom, filling theaters. The celebrated Croker's College in California not only trains frogs to jump, it even has a graduation day. Champion jumper Jelly Bean was owned by Ronald Reagan before he left to the White House. All amphibians have one thing in common, their porous skin. Most animal skins are designed to prevent the loss of water, but amphibian skin is far more prone to leak. There's no problem when amphibians are in water where there's plenty of moisture inside and out. The trouble comes when they go on land. Their skin is like a sieve. For this reason, amphibians rarely wander far from water. In Germany, this dependency on water has been used to forecast the weather. In a frog barometer, the frog goes down when the sun shines and goes up in anticipation of rain. Unfortunately, frogs have become environmental barometers as well. Changes in the ozone layer have killed off entire species of frogs, probably due to increases in ultraviolet light, known to be the cause of human skin cancer. But how do frogs survive in the desert? In a word, patience. The cyclorana frog builds itself a transparent bag and waits as long as seven years for the rains to arrive. When the time finally comes for this amphibian Rip Van Winkle to crawl out of the sack, 
The bag provides the frog's first meal. Because frogs come out to greet a rain shower, people used to believe they weren't born but fell from the skies along with the rain. In 19th century England, they even tried catching them to prove it. The wax frog, which lives high in the trees, retains moisture in dry weather by producing wax from its skin and coating itself. The red-eyed tree frog prevents the loss of moisture on a hot day by curling up in the shade. Having traded the watery confines of the egg for the pond, the tadpole soon loses its feathery gills and grows lungs. Sight and hearing are developing too. Hearing is acute in frogs and toads and is used to find a mate. The male koki frog has a two-part call, but the females hear only the high-pitched mating part, whereas other males hear only the lower warning tone. Good hearing is vital to the American bullfrog. The males are aggressive, constantly listening for competitors. Their huge and sensitive ears are twice the size of their eyes. Because amphibian eyesight has adapted to many habitats, their eyeballs come in all shapes and sizes. For night vision, eyes come in cat-like slits, both horizontal and vertical. There are even square pupils and heart-shaped ones. Amphibian eyes come in a wide range of colors. Yet they only see in two colors, black and white. This predator has the ability to see in ultraviolet. Very little escapes its keen eyesight. but its prey has a trick up its sleeve. The frog's skin reflects the same amount of ultraviolet light as the leaf it's sitting on, so the frog and plant become indistinguishable, a disappearing act. All the snake sees is an empty leaf. In this case, the frog's adaptation wins the day. On the evolutionary road to survival, the amphibian has adorned itself in many colors. It can blend in with the greenish browns of moss. Or gleam chocolate brown in a bed of mud. It will spread itself weed-like at the bottom of a pond. Or simply be a leaf. This dark tree frog doesn't use color as much as it uses its head. Retreating into the narrow depths of a plant, it only exposes its skull, which is as hard as a helmet. While some amphibians disappear to survive, others go on display. The bright hues of a poison dark frog are a warning much like the colors found in the headdresses of Native Americans. Amphibian colors are nature's way of saying, don't dine on me.
The golden dart is the most poisonous frog on earth. The skin of one frog could kill 1,000 people, one of nature's most deadly poisons. After six weeks, a tadpole grows what will allow it to leave the water, legs. 400 million years ago, some fish were making the move from water to land. The evolution of fins to legs had begun. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. 400 years ago, as Shakespeare's witches stirred their steaming kettle, people knew well the evil ingredients of their brew. Frog. Wool of bat and tongue of dog, round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Toad that under cold stone days and nights has thirty-one sweltered venom sleeping got. Boil thy first in the charmed pot. By tradition, the toad is the first and key ingredient in any spell. The powerful poison of some amphibians has long been recognized as a weapon. The Chaco Indians use it to poison their blowpipe darts. But the skin of amphibians can also be used in the battle against illness. In 1986, an entire new class of antibiotics was found in the skin of an African clawed frog. They were named meganins after the Hebrew word for shields. And even more recently, a painkiller with 200 times the power of morphine has been discovered in the skin of a frog. To survive in the world of skillful hunters such as bats, spiders, snakes, birds, and fish, amphibians have devised clever defenses. In preparation for his battles, Toad of Toad Hall is famous for puffing himself up. But upon seeing the enemy, he often thinks better of it. Others use bluff with more success. A threatening noise backed up by a fearsome face persuades a possum to dine elsewhere. Unlike the blustering Mr. Toad, some really do puff themselves up. And in a world where size is often perceived as power, the bluff often works. Although the green back of a fire-bellied toad seems harmless enough, this toad will twist itself into a mini-monster and flash its red belly to signal danger. In the face of such a display, many a predator will back off. A pair of false eyes can also create the illusion of size and deceive a predator. The salamander can play dead or threatened by flashing its brilliant yellow underside. Their fiery color wasn't the only reason the Greeks called them fire lizards. Having witnessed salamanders running from burning logs, ancient people believed the salamander was born in fire and lived in flames. Impossible, of course, but living in ice is not. Some amphibians can survive in temperatures well below freezing. In winter, two-thirds of the water in a Canadian gray tree frog turns to ice. The heart stops beating, yet it remains alive by producing its own antifreeze, which prevents it from freezing solid. With the spring thaw, the frog emerges from cold storage. The organs start working again. Muscles begin moving. The frog has survived the long Canadian winter and leaps into the new season. Although frozen frogs have never appeared on supermarket shelves, canned frogs have. In the 50s, they were all the rage. And at Dr. Brawl's frog canning factory, it spoons at the ready as Dr. Brawl's frog tasters spring into action. Yes, they're frying frogs for food buffs from Fargo to Philadelphia, and somebody has to taste them. 
Mmm, that's good, and oops, he's got a frog in his throat. Never mind, it's just a small hiccup as Dr. Brawl's new enterprise leapfrogs to success. Whereas humans usually prefer food that's no longer alive, amphibians prefer food that's still moving. If it's got a pulse, it's lunch. All amphibians have a sticky tongue attached in the front of their mouth, extending its reach as it lashes out. An amphibian swallowing blink not only protects the eyes, but pushes the eyeballs back, helping to force the food down the throat. After catching without looking, it's a good idea to clean what you can. But a sticky tongue has its drawbacks. How do you get rid of a bombardier beetle that tastes awful? Some amphibians have huge appetites. One African bullfrog devoured 14 baby cobras at one sitting, the equivalent of a man swallowing two dozen newborn lambs, including the woolen wrapper. After nine weeks in the pond, the miniature frog has lungs that gulp air from the surface and grows front legs. Each step of its transformation from pond dweller to land animal echoes millions of years of evolution. There is one salamander that changes with the weather. When water is plentiful, it has gills and lives underwater. But in times of drought, it develops lungs, taking a huge gulp of air from the surface and its gills disappear. With lungs and a body capable of life on land, its metamorphosis is complete. Remaining at midpoint in evolution is the lungfish. Despite moving onto land 400 million years ago, it still moves with the s wriggle of a fish. Salamanders use the S motion to swim, so do newts when they crawl. While the frog, with webbing between its toes, demonstrates perfectly the term frog kick. Above the water in the trees, it's the sticky pads on the tree frog's fingers and toes and its large eyes which are crucial. And its color, mimicking the green of the leaves. It even has a bright stripe on its side to suggest a flash of sunlight. Yet water still remains essential, even to the tree dweller. The tree frog builds its nest over water. When the tadpoles hatch, they drop straight in. The red-eyed tree frog's large eyes give it superb vision, an absolute must when it comes to snaring fast-moving insects. In the trees, webbed feet can also come in handy. Spreading their feet like mini parachutes, some frogs can glide. Why hop when you can fly? Clinging fingers, clammy skin, the warts of a toad. Are these the characteristics that contribute to the human aversion to amphibians? An aversion we have expressed throughout the ages in fairy tale and film. Sometimes more humorously than horrifically. The most well-known example of the frog's maligned reputation is the tale of the prince trapped in a frog's body who needed a princess's kiss to set him free. In 16th century England, a woman found with a toad in her house would be instantly accused of witchcraft and put on trial. But why the toad? Do the warts of human aging and the toad's knobbly skin make the witch and the toad kindred spirits? Do they both possess uncanny powers of darkness? Since ancient times, there have been countless stories of stones splitting open without explanation. 
to reveal a toad walled up within. Witchcraft? Sorcery? No, simply hibernation. To keep warm in winter, toads will hide anywhere dark and damp. When they wake up in the spring, they hit the road and migrate to their breeding grounds. Not all amphibians migrate, but salamanders do, and newts as well. Perhaps the most well-known traveling amphibian is the toad. To reach their particular breeding ground, which is also the place of their birth, toads will stop at nothing. They will cross highways, mountains, ignore other breeding grounds, and travel up to nine miles. How they actually find their way back to their home pond still remains a mystery. The greatest army of toads ever seen was not in the march of migration, but in the spread of cane toads in Australia. Brought in from America to rid sugarcane of pests, they quickly became pests themselves, raiding gardens and even stealing food from pets. The skin secretion of cane toads are highly hallucinogenic. For a time in California, toad licking was popular in some circles. Kiss a frog and you might see a prince. Lick a toad and who knows what you'll see. Nine weeks after birth, the froglet's tail has served its purpose and shrinks in anticipation of the move to land. Having completed their migration, the pond is full. The males arrive first and croak to attract females. The frog's croak is not, as ancient peoples believed, the strangled cry of a newborn, but it's the beginning of the process. They are the urgent calls of adults seeking a mate. One croak can carry well over half a mile, and there are millions of them. Humans may have strange ways to attract a mate, but the amphibian world certainly has its share of peculiar partnering. Like Dracula, the vampire salamander enslaves the female by biting her neck. But instead of sucking her blood, he injects an aphrodisiac. From that moment on, she slavishly follows him until he fertilizes her eggs. Most males, however, have no such tricks. And since they outnumber the females by about five to one, the privilege of mating goes to the winner of a pond wrestling contest. In the amphibian world, it is during amplexus that eggs are laid and fertilized. Egg laying can range from the single egg of the Cuban poison arrow frog to the 35,000 eggs that one toad can lay in a year. <laughs> Amphibian males can make caring fathers. The Suriname toad gently arranges the eggs on the female's back where they will incubate for several months before hatching. These eggs are from the Siberian salamander, the only one found in the Arctic Circle. The male defends them by opening its mouth wide in a posture designed to frighten away predators.
Perhaps the most unusual adaptation is that of the male Darwin's frog. He takes the eggs into his mouth as soon as they show signs of life. And inside his mouth, they continue to grow until the tiny froglets are ready to jump out. After 12 weeks, the frog leaves the pond. One small hop for the frog, one giant leap for evolution. 350 million years ago, the first amphibians crossed this same barrier and populated the earth. By the time the Egyptians created the myth about a frog-headed goddess who sculpted humans, the other sculptor of life, evolution, had taken the basic material of amphibian and shaped reptiles, birds, mammals, and humans. The Egyptians also believed that frogs were partially formed humans. In one respect, they were right. In evolutionary terms, the amphibian anticipates the human embryo. The Eyewitness Museum, created by combining traditional filmmaking techniques with state-of-the-art graphics, stripping away the mysteries of nature and science to reveal the essence of each subject. Bringing the world into sharp focus. The making of Eyewitness. The distinct style of the eyewitness books is the basis for each of the programs. Each half-hour episode is based on a book title. The eyewitness book's visual style gives the program makers a starting point and a challenge. The challenge of transferring the clarity and super-realism into moving images and sound. Now let's take a look behind the scenes at the making of Amphibian. We shot the exploding rock in the eyewitness studio. The rock was made out of fiberglass in two halves which fitted together very tightly. They were blown apart with compressed air. We used dry ice to create the right atmosphere for the shot, with a little help from the director. A small explosive charge was placed in the rock to create a visual explosion. Our pyrotechnics experts made sure the flash would not harm the cameraman.
After several takes, we were happy we had the explosion, and it was time to place the toads in one half of the exploded rock. This proved difficult as the toads were unwilling to stay put. But finally, we got the shot we wanted. Another special effect used in the amphibian program was fire. We created a small set to represent the Eyewitness Museum, in which we first filmed several salamanders. Fire on a film set has to be carefully controlled. It's important to keep a pilot light lit in case of any leaks. The set had flame bars positioned along each side. Although each take only lasted 10 seconds, the set had to be repainted each time. The camera and cameraman were protected by fireproof glass. and a fireman was standing by. During the take, we fired a flame cannon from the far end of the set, a dramatic effect requiring expert supervision. Although the salamanders were never near the flames, the illusion illustrated the myth of them being born out of fire. In Amphibian, we decided to reverse the myth of the princess and the frog, our princess, instead of turning the frog into a handsome prince, turns herself into a cackling witch. But she seems happy enough with the result.